Hi guys. We're going to talk about um, earthquakes that happen at convergent plate boundaries today. This is chapter five in the Tectonics I book. All right. Um, convergent plate boundaries are where most earthquakes happen. We also see them along transform boundaries and even divergent boundaries. So anywhere where there's movement, obviously movement of the earth, if it's abrupt, if there's a lot of energy that's released, that's going to be an earthquake. But convergent plate boundaries seem to have the most earthquakes or the most major earthquakes. Okay. Um, we start out here with this picture of Pakistan. You can see all these little tents here. This is a refugee camp that was set up after a big earthquake. And that happens a lot um, when there's a large disaster in an area, they have to house people in some way if their homes were destroyed. And a lot of times those structures that they put them in are dangerous also. Um, a lot of times after an earthquake, the most damage and the most dangerous time is the minutes, hours, and days after a large earthquake because we have what are called aftershocks. When there's a lot of pent-up energy in a rock and it buckles and shifts and creates an earthquake, it doesn't all happen at once, right? Okay, so picture two plates sliding side by side. They're flexing and a whole bunch of energy is released well, that's going to continue to kind of slip for a while. And they can have what are called aftershock earthquakes that happen for sometimes up to months after a large earthquake. But for sure they have aftershocks throughout the next several days. And the problem with that is that after an initial earthquake, Sometimes buildings fall down and there's rubble everywhere and people are scrambling to try to save people or recover people that might have been kind of buried within all of this rubble. And in doing that, when these aftershocks happen, that can be a very dangerous situation. So what I mean by aftershocks, let me show you a seismogram here. This is a seismogram of a typical earthquake. Okay, so you can see that the lines up here are kind of squiggly because the earth is always quaking and it's red just like a book. So it goes from left to right, line after line after line, and then you get to this line and this is where that initial earthquake happens. Okay, so here's the P wave, it fizzles out, here's the S wave, and it fizzles out. But then if you look as the lines go on, there's all of these shifts that happen afterwards and sometimes they can be up into the several hundreds of earthquakes in the following week or two after a big earthquake. Okay, and sometimes those earthquakes are as big as the original earthquake. They're not just tiny little tremors. Many of them, like if you've got a 7.0 on the, on the Richter scale, many of the aftershocks can be like a 6.5, a 6.6. And that's a significant earthquake in itself. And if you think of that, you know, having a massive earthquake and then having several more that are almost as big happen in that same day, that's a really kind of sticky situation to be in. <clears throat> okay, so um, it says earthquakes at convergent plate boundaries mark the motions of subducting lithosphere as it plunges through the mantle. Okay, so normally if we look at a map of tectonic plate boundaries, normally when we have convergence, we will have ocean to ocean convergence. A lot of times we have ocean to continental plate convergence, like where this Juan de Fuca plate is subducting underneath. Um, there is ocean to continental here, there is ocean to continental here, ocean to continental here. So most convergent boundaries are a boundary between a continental crust and an oceanic crust. And when that happens, the oceanic crust is more dense and so it will subduct underneath. And when that happens, it drags that leading edge of the continental crust as it's going down and it's going down and it's going down, eventually this continental crust will pop up 
And when it pops up, that's when you get a really big earthquake. There are some um, conversion boundaries that happen from continent to continent, like right up here by the Indian plate and the Eurasian plate. And this is actually where the Himalayan mountains are, okay? So if you have two plates that are converging that are the same density, most often they're going to push up and they're going to create these really jagged mountains just like the Himalayans. But also, while that's happening, there can be shifting and faulting, folding happening. So this area right here is also prone to a lot of earthquakes as well. Okay, so whenever there's a convergent boundary, there is quite a few earthquakes in those areas. All right, <clears throat> this picture right here just shows um, earthquake epicenters with depth out with the depth outlines, the subducting plate with shallow, intermediate, and deep earthquakes. Okay, so right here, here's distance along the profile in kilometers, okay? So how big of an area was the epicenter? Okay, so this is a small, um, small area on land up to 250 kilometers, okay? And then those earthquakes that have that affect a really large area, a really large area, like from, let's see, 300 to 1,000, that'd be 700 kilometers right here. Those are those earthquakes that happen shallow. Okay, and that makes sense because as we've talked about, where there's a break in the rock underneath the ground, if it's shallow or if it's close to the surface of the earth, that wave doesn't have very far to go before it shakes the surface of the earth. So it has a lot of energy there, okay? If it's really deep down underground, it has to travel quite a ways to get to the surface and it loses some of its energy. So this graph is just showing that the shallower the earthquake is, okay, so this would be the surface of the earth, the shallower it is, the greater the area it is going to affect on land, all right? So the first type of convergence we're gonna talk about is where ocean, an ocean boundary and an ocean boundary are converging. Two ocean boundaries are converging. And that happens along with a lot of other boundaries right underneath the continent uh, or the country of Japan. If you look at where Japan is, they are situated on top of one, two, three, four major plates. And then also, if you really zoomed in on Japan, they um, some of these major plates have broken up into smaller plates. And so Japan is kind of sitting on top of a lot of land that is constantly moving. And that creates all kinds of tectonic activity in Japan. One earthquakes. They have a lot of earthquakes there. Two, they have active volcanoes there. And three, because they are an island country, if there is a volcanic eruption or an earthquake, there is also the potential to have a pretty catastrophic tsunami. And we'll talk about tsunamis in future chapters. But Japan is kind of set up in a really tricky spot and they have a lot of tectonic activity so they've done things differently you know they have different architecture their buildings are built differently so that they sway with the movement of the earth um, they have a lot of <clears throat> precautionary things um, like their their um, nuclear power plants are safeguarded in a way from you know some of this tectonic movement although those safeguards don't always function um, against the power of the earth as we learned in 2011. It says earthquakes in Japan are caused by ocean to ocean convergence. The Philippine plate and the Pacific plate both of those plates are subducting underneath the North American or Eurasian plates. This complex plate tectonic situation creates a chain of volcanoes, which are the Japanese islands, okay? Those islands of Japan are made from volcanic activity and as many as 1,500 earthquakes annually. A small country like Japan gets 1,500 earthquakes annually, and that's not counting the volcanic eruptions and the tsunamis. 
In 2011, an enormous 9.0 earthquake struck off the Sendai in northeastern Japan. This quake, which is now known as the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, was the most powerful to ever strike Japan and one of the top five known in the world. I'm trying to do my math here to think if you guys were around, you were little in 2011. I was working here in 2011, and actually my cousin lived in Japan at this time. So it was a very scary time for us um, when this disaster struck. We couldn't, you know, cell phone service was down and we couldn't get a hold of them. Um, luckily, she was far enough away from it that she was not, she felt the earthquake, but she was not affected by what happened afterwards, which was the tsunami. Okay, so it says damage from the earthquake was nearly overshadowed by the tsunami that it generated, which wiped out coastal cities and towns. Several months after the earthquake, about 22,000 people were dead or missing, and 190,000 buildings had been damaged or destroyed. Um, I was looking up some stats on this particular earthquake, and they actually had 265 aftershock earthquakes within one week following this. They still had them for months to come. But those 265 that happened in the following week, right after this one in March, they were really big. I mean, the original one was nine. These were all like sevens and eights, major, major earthquakes. And if you picture a situation like what this picture is right here, and trying to dig through this and find your belongings and find survivors and having the earth continually shake like that, in the midst of a tsunami is pretty terrifying. Okay, another one is ocean to continent convergence. And we, um, I'll be talking about this one a lot more when we talk about this little guy here, this Wanda Fuca plate, there isn't arrows right here, but this is convergence between the North American plate and the Wanda Fuca plate. This guy is subducting underneath the United States. And that causes all of these volcanoes that are found from British Columbia all the way down into California. And we'll talk about that when we talk about earthquakes in a couple chapters. But at the same time it, it forms volcanoes, it also has that same danger of when an oceanic plate is subducting underneath, it catches that leading edge of the continental plate, and eventually that pressure will build up and this one will pop. Okay? It causes what's called uplift, okay, so when those two plates are coming together and it's dragging that one down, the shoreline or the boundary, the continental boundary that's being kind of, that's stuck and being caught will cause this uplift. And so you get all these cliffs, there's cliffs all along here, big cliffs that go all the way down to the ocean. And that's from that uplift from this plate subducting underneath. And eventually that's going to pop. When I say eventually, well, those kinds of situations don't create constant earthquakes. Um, they happen in this area anyway. They happen, a really, really big one will happen every 300 to 600 years or so. Okay, well, you think, well, we're scot-free. Well, the last one happened in 1700. And so we're due. We're at the low end of being due for one to happen. That just means that a lot of energy has built up over the last 300 years. Okay, so there's a lot of pent up energy at that boundary right now. Um, and that last earthquake that happened in 1700 was estimated to be around a nine on the, on the Richter scale. Well, in the 1700s, that might not have done as much damage. But now if you think of the cities that are along that whole area, got Seattle and Portland and you know, all of those big major ports, that could be pretty catastrophic, okay? We also have continent to continent. Again, that is in, um, an example of that would be right up here, continent to continent. And this is where the Himalayan mountains are built from that convergence. And they are also subject to earthquakes happening there from all of that pressure building up and giving every once in a while. Okay, so one that happened was in um, 2001, 
and that one was responsible for 20,000 deaths, and many, many people became injured or homeless in that situation, okay? So this is just a quick overview of convergent plate boundaries and the earthquakes that happen there. If we look back at the map, that is going to be the same right here. It's going to be the same where the Car Caribbean plate meet right here um, with the Cocos plate. There's convergence there. That's subducting underneath, okay? So they have a lot of earthquakes right along here. They have a lot of earthquakes here. They have a lot of earthquakes right here. A ton of earthquakes right up here because there's... Um, this is a convergent boundary here. It doesn't say that on here, but this is convergent, and this is convergent, and this is convergent. So all along where Japan is, there's earthquakes. Um, there's earthquakes right here. In fact, the biggest one we've ever had in the continental United States was up in Alaska in 1964, and that was from this convergent of these two oceanic plates. Okay, so wherever you see convergence like this, um, you can expect that there are some pretty big earthquakes, and not just big earthquakes, but they're numerous. There's a lot of them, okay? Another place you will find um, earthquakes is transform boundaries. Transform boundaries like this one is sliding past. When it's sliding past like that, it is creating a lot of potential energy, and eventually that rock will buckle and shift, okay? And this that makes sense right here because this is where that whole fault line is in California, the San Andreas Fault Zone. That whole area is all kind of broken up, and that is because these two plates are grinding past each other. Alrighty, so that is that chapter. Um, there are two videos here at the end. I think I'm going to post just one of them um, for you to see on the Google Classroom, and then there will be a question that goes right along with it. And we will continue on. The next chapter is um, Earthquakes That Transform Plate Boundaries. So we talk more specifically about the San Andreas Fault next. I'll talk to you soon.